Again, this Sunday evening, we come to a, a lengthy section of the book of Daniel. Um, I almost said the gospel of Daniel. Um, and that actually is not a mistake, because every, every book of the Old Testament is the gospel according to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. The gospel runs from Genesis 1 right through to Revelation 22 and the last verse. Um, so there is a real sense in which the gospel is being preached to us here. But let's, let's read this, this wonderful chapter in, in stages as we go through. Uh, <clears throat> we'll read to, to verse 18 from verse 1. First of all, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay on my, in bed in the fancies and in the, the, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make it known, make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me, he who is named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts of the gra in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by decree, the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliness, lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. This is God's holy word. Let's pick up where we left off in our reading in Daniel chapter 4, picking up at verse 19 and re reading through to verse 33. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream of, or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached to the heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which all was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. 
And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the, in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field and let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King that you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for, for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, <coughs> that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. So far the reading of God's holy word. Let's read the closing verses of, of Daniel chapter 4 from verse 34. <clears throat> At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting kingdom, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. This is God's word. Well, let's turn back to this passage for a few moments as we consider uh, this next section of the Book of Daniel, uh, this extraordinary insight into the way that the God of Israel is the same God who is the God of all the nations, and even the pagan nations of the ancient world uh, were under his oversight and subject to his will. Uh, and as we come to this particular chapter, it has to be one of the most extraordinary and the most magnificent chapters in the entire Bible. It's a chapter of great contrasts. It, it takes us to the, the heights of earthly power. We're talking here about uh, the mightiest man on the face of the earth at that time, as we, uh, as we, we think of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, but we, we see, too, the fact that God rules over even the mightiest men, and he is able to bring them low. But even more than that, this mighty man who was full of himself and his own pride and his own arrogance, brought low by God, could have been abandoned in his low estate, cast out forever, snuffed out 
at a single word from God's lips. And yet the self-same God who brought him low brought him to repentance, convicted him of his sin, and caused him to cry out to God for mercy. And God answered his prayer and restored him and indeed saved him to make him his very own. On the one hand, in this chapter, we see human nature in all its arrogance at its very worst and in all its ugliness. But on the other hand, we see God in all his might and all his power. He is the Lord of all the universe. He is the God who controls everything that happens from the inner workings of the tiniest particles of matter right through to the outer reaches of outer space, right down to the individual actions, thoughts, and words of every human being. God is intimately not only involved in, but in control of all that is unfolding in the lives of people in this world. He is the God of might and power, but he is the God of gentleness and grace and mercy. And that's an extraordinary thing. People are inclined to think that we should fear God because he is the judge of all the earth. But the real reason why we should fear God, that is revere him and honor him, because although he is the judge of all the earth, the God who is the upholder of perfect righteousness, the one to whom everyone must answer one day and give an account of themselves, he is simultaneously, without any contradiction or confusion, he is the savior of the world. The God of justice is also the God of grace and mercy. The God who has every right to condemn us and consign us to the depths of hell, is the God who alone is able to rescue us and lift us up to the heights of heaven. And, and this is what we're seeing in microcosm in this event. And, and as, as the gospel is preached to Nebuchadnezzar by this God through his providential dealings with him, interpreted by the, the, the interpretation of the dream that was given to him, Nebuchadnezzar the worshipper of pagan idols, falls down at the feet of the true and living God. <clears throat> but the discomforting thing about the first side of this chapter is that the contrast that it makes um, doesn't just provide a, a glimpse into the heart of a pagan king who lived over two and a half thousand years ago, but as the Bible is a mirror which provides a reflection of ourselves, God is showing the truth about what goes on in our heart. We might not be mighty kings and queens of great empires with great palaces and, and great accomplishments of which we can boast on a large scale, but is it not true that we secretly congratulate ourselves, that we secretly take pride in our achievements? And we forget that we are dependent every moment of every day upon the grace of the God who gave us life and the God who alone is able to sustain us. The head of an empire with millions of subjects becomes a life-size model of all men and women and how we all stand by nature before this God. And so too, as we look at God's dealings with Nebuchadnezzar, it very quickly becomes clear that the way in which God deals with kings and rulers is no different from the way that he deals with humble human beings <clears throat> in the affairs of men and the affairs of states and governments. Often special dispensation is given to those who hold high office uh, or who are born into royal, royal families, that, that they are excused for things that other mortals would not be excused for. They get away with things that perhaps others would be brought to justice for. But here, the way that God deals with this king gives him no exemption. It doesn't let him off the hook just because of his high position and his massive empire. And in that sense, if Nebuchadnezzar is a, a model of our race in all its mess, then God's dealings with him in that mess is a paradigm of how he deals with all of us. How he deals with all of us. 
It is the case that if we are honest with ourselves and, and we look into the inner recesses of our hearts as we do from time to time, every one of us, if we are being truthful, are filled with shame and sorrow over the state of our lives, even as those who profess the name of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and as we've said so many times before, it's, it's so striking that Paul who had been Saul of Tarsus and who once, at one stage of his life had been a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one who was zealous for a warped evangelical faith of his day because the Pharisees were the evangelicals of their day. But he had allowed it to become self-righteousness, not grace righteousness. And, and he had boasted of what he had achieved and what he had done and what he had sanctioned as he stood by and watched the stoning of Stephen as the first martyr for the Christian gospel. <clears throat> and when we look at that within ourselves, we, we realize we need a God who is merciful to us. Lord, if you should mark iniquity, which one of us could stand? And the key to understanding what happens and where it all leads is found in the words that God speaks and the response that the king gives. <clears throat> I, I've, I've given this, this evening's sermon a, uh, a title. I give all my sermons titles for, for good or ill. That's, it's meant to discipline a preacher to keep on track and, and keep focused on what he's saying. And tonight's sermon is given the title, A King Who Learned the Hard Way. And the, and the reason for that was he could have learned the lesson in a much easier way and much more quickly if he had but listened to the revelation that God had given in the first place. We see how that is so, but I think the most wonderful thing about what happens next is that God would not let this man rest in his foolishness. He invaded his space. He troubled his soul. He brought him low, only to bring him to an end of himself and then raise him to a higher position. It wasn't simply that he restored the kingdom to him, but he restored him, the kingdom to him as a king whose heart had been made new. As a king who was now a child of God and a servant of the king of kings and lord of lords. Why is it that he learned the hard way? Here's a number of things that we notice. He had experienced God, but he was not yet saved. That's the first thing. He had had an experience of God, but he was not yet saved. It's no accident that the, the events of this chapter come hard on the heels of what's recorded in the previous two chapters, uh, which indicate that this was not the first time that King Nebuchadnezzar found himself face to face with the king of heaven. Not once, but twice, he had witnessed firsthand the power of the God of the Israelites at work in a way unlike anything that he had seen before. Uh, the first was the, the dream that he dreamed back in, in chapter 2 um, and, and the dream of, of the, the statue that was composed of, of different types of metal and, and mixtures of, of clay and iron down in the feet. And, and he was deeply troubled by the dream, as we saw a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and he asked his own astrologers and, and his own wise men to interpret the dream, um, but they could not do it. And it was only the, 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 this, this teenager from the Israelites, Daniel, one of the exiles, who, when he realized he was about to be put to death because he was simply numbered amongst the wise men and the astrologers who were about to be put to death for not being able to interpret the dream, he, he asked to have an audience with the king and to hear the dream in order that he might interpret it. And that's exactly what he did. And, and Nebuchadnezzar is, is overwhelmed by the fact that, that the interpretation matches up to what he saw and made sense of what lay ahead, lay ahead by giving him a glimpse of the future. And again in chapter 3, the, uh, another image, this time constructed on the plains of Dura. Um, clearly Nebuchadnezzar had been struck by the uniqueness of the God of the Israelites, um, but he was far from recognizing him to be the only true God, 
And so he set up a, t- a statue and, and, and he, he called for, for all his subjects to, to pay homage, to bow down and worship this sat- statue upon pain of death. <coughs> Indeed, of pain of a terrible death, being thrown into a fiery furnace. And, and again, three other Israelites, close friends and associates of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they refused to obey the king's command. Calmly, they looked him in the eye and said, O king, live forever, but we will not do this. And and if you do throw us into the fiery furnace, our God is able to rescue us if he so desires. But if if that is not his will, then we accept his will and we will perish in the flames rather than bow down before a lump of gold. And on both occasions, Nebuchadnezzar had apparently made a response to God, issuing statements to his empire in chapter 2 and verse 47 and again in verses 28 and 29 of of chapter 3 he 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 was prepared to go on record as saying the god of the israelites is no ordinary god he is to be revered he is to be honored amongst the gods and yet for all that he had seen and all that he had heard and all that he'd experienced through his interactions with these these four young men from from Israel who had such extraordinary graces and extraordinary abilities and who were not ashamed to speak of Jehovah, the God of Israel, as the one in whom they hoped and trusted. This man had not yet bowed the knee to the Lord. And so as this chapter takes us into the defining period of his life, what's recorded here. Um, in in this passage is is an autobiographical testimony. Um, He he prefaces it with the words um, there in in, in verse 2. Peace be multiplied to all of you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. This is my personal testimony. Let me tell you how I was brought from darkness to light, from being under the sentence of death, to a whole new life through this God of this people that we have captured and taken into exile. What's significant about his testimony is the fact that it's punctuated with the words, for me, what God has done for me. That there was a a personal element in the way that this God related. That That was unknown to the gods of the ancient, ancient world. They were gods who were capricious. They were gods who were self, self-gratifying. They were unpredictable. Um, and, and the idea of, of somebody who worshipped one of the gods of the ancient religions, um, being able to say that God has done this for me specifically, was, 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 was beyond imagination. But, but he encounters the God of Israel, and he says, let me tell you what the God of Israel has done for me. And this episode brought it all home to him. So here was a man who'd experienced God, but he had not experienced God's salvation. And this comes out clearly in the first part of his testimony. So in that sense, Nebuchadnezzar is not unlike many people who've had an experience of God, but don't actually know him for themselves. They've perhaps been taught to say the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But if you put them on the spot and say, excuse me, go over those words again. Our Father. Can, can you genuinely say from your heart that God is your heavenly Father? The one in whom, whose promise you have trusted for your salvation. The one whose son is the one you look to as your savior. Or are these just words that you learned in school or somewhere else and you round them off by heart? And it isn't just that there are those who are exposed to God by attending church and listening to his words, but they themselves have had some perhaps very distant encounters with him in the past when they've been brought under conviction of sin, realized that they cannot cannot change themselves and make themselves acceptable to God, but then they've drifted. The book of Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5 speaks of those who have tasted of the powers of the age to come, but have then turned away. (laughs) 
But that's not speaking about people who have been truly converted. But those who have come under the influence of the Holy Spirit, convicting them of sin, giving them a, a glimpse of the glories of new life in Christ. And, and there's perhaps been a longing and a leaning towards that. And they get so far and they're going in the right direction and then suddenly they just veer off and consign it all to history. Because they're not genuine believers. Likewise in John's letter, chapter one, his first epistle, and the third chapter, he speaks about those who have gone out from us. They seemed like faithful members of the church, very much part of the congregation, but they departed and they went back to their old ways and their old religions. And then John pauses and says, but they were not of us from the first. From the first. They'd been in the company of Christians, but they themselves had not, not actually found the wonder of God's salvation. Jesus himself speaks not just of some, but many who think that they have a place in heaven, but whenever they find themselves passing through that gate that leads from this world to the next, through the gates of death, or if they live until his return, finding him themselves face to face with him as the judge of all the earth, and they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do A, B, C, D, and E in your name? And he will say, depart from me. Because you never knew me. And I never knew you. We shouldn't get be confused between being impressed by God or even being astounded by God and having God as our saviour. Doesn't mean to say that, that we will not be impressed by God and astounded by God as those who are redeemed, but simply being overawed by the wonder of who God is isn't in and of itself, what it means to be in a, a living and joyful relationship with him as those who have been forgiven and those who have been accepted as sons and daughters into his family. It's even possible to have very moving spiritual experiences that are a long way short of actually experiencing salvation itself. So Nebuchadnezzar himself lays down a marker for us in terms of what he had seen and what he had heard and yet was still so far away. Secondly, he was warned by God, but he didn't listen. Nebuchadnezzar is clearly deeply affected by the signs and wonders that God had performed for him, but he is even more affected by the word. Um, all the signs and wonders, dreams and interpretations he saw have one common thread running through them. They were the means of getting his attention in order that he might listen to the word of God. You know, in, in, in the past 120-something years since the, the birth of the Pentecostal movement in Azusa Street in California and the rise of the charismatic movement in the 60s and afterwards, um, there, there's, been, there's been great excitement over, over signs and wonders and miraculous occurrences and prophecies and, and all these things. But the whole purpose of the signs and wonders that we find in Scripture are to point away from themselves to God in heaven and especially to the words that God is speaking. Signs and wonders grab our attention in order that we might listen to the one who has sent the signs and wonders in order that he might speak to us and we might listen. So these were all instances that were tied into the message that was coming to him that were intended to show God's supernatural character. He was not like any other God that was, had been invented by men because he is the true and living God. So the most important thing about these incidents was the message that was bound up with them. They alone explained the meaning of what was happening to him. Now, now, every culture and, and every religion of the world can say strange things happen in life. There's things that defy explanation. But those strange things can be interpreted in all kinds of ways, and it's left to the imagination of the individual to make, make what they will of them. And, and, and believe me, there are some crazy interpretations offered whenever strange things happen to those around us. 
But in the Bible, God's supernatural deeds are always accompanied by his supernatural words that make sense of them. God always explains, and we said before, you look at the miracles of Jesus, especially the way that John records them. Miracle, sermon, miracle, sermon. That, that Jesus explains the miracle, that they're not to be fixated by the displays of, of otherworldly power. They are to be fixated by the words of the one who is behind this otherworldly power. And so the bulk of the chapter is taken up with God speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and spelling out clearly what he was saying. He speaks at a most unusual time. Verse 4, clearly things were going incredibly well. I was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. And it was then when things were, for him, at their very best. And he saw a dream, and I was afraid. Mm-hmm. And that's significant, because so often people cry out to God whenever they're at rock bottom, whenever their world is falling apart. But this man was on the crest of a wave. He was at the peak of his success. And at that point, God comes crashing into his life in a way that shakes the very foundations of his existence. He speaks here at a time when the king thought his life was untroubled. And he finds himself being troubled by a dream in the night. And he couldn't understand why he was being so deeply unsettled for humanly speaking, He should have been the happiest man on the planet. But interestingly, despite his past experience of dreams and their interpretations, he doesn't immediately turn to Daniel or his friends. He still sees him, and and he he sees Daniel's God as one among many. In some ways, the gods of the ancient world were like the the apps on a modern cell phone. Um, there's an app for everything. Um, and it's amazing what you can turn to. If you're stuck for something, you just flick on your phone, you look up what you've got in your apps, and if it's not there, go to the app store, and you'll find what you're looking for. So in the ancient world, there were so many gods, there was a god for everything. You know, if, if you look for um, uh, uh, issues about the weather, then you consulted Baal because he was the storm god, the weather god. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar realizes that there is only one God who has the ring of truth about him. And in that sense, true conversion will always recognize the utter uniqueness of God and his word, and especially of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Look to Jesus, and you will live. Trust in Jesus. And you'll be accepted. The king relates his dream to Daniel and Daniel explains the dream to the king. And even though its passage is one that is painful for this high-ranking civil servant to deliver, verse 19, um, but the whole point of this lengthy section is that despite all that God said so clearly, the king did not listen, verses 28 to 30. You'd think after... The incredible interpretation, the king would have come to his senses. But at the end of 12 months, just a year later, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. He surveys his domain and says, wow, this is my doing. What a good boy am I. He's praising himself, trusting in his own achievements. Like so many others who hear God's word. They may be struck by it, they may be impressed by it, but it doesn't change them. But then finally he was crushed by God, but only in order that God might remake him. God's message and its fulfillment in this man's experience is chilling and yet wonderful at the same time. It's chilling because we see this great man reduced literally to the level of an animal. His... his, Mental health collapses completely. 
He, he can't be kept inside the palace. He becomes uh, an embarrassment to his own family. And, and he, is, he goes out into the, into the fields and he lives among the animals. And nobody tries to rescue him or bring him back to his senses. He's abandoned even by his very own. He suffered a complete reversal of fortune. He chose to ignore what God had so clearly said to him, only to discover that God actually always means what he says, and we are fools if we do not take him seriously. But in a deeper sense, this king becomes a life-size model of what's happened to our entire race in Adam and his fall, as we've been seeing in the book of Genesis these past Sunday mornings. God's appointed king of creation, that's what Adam was, so he was the vice regent of God on earth, implementing his heavenly rule through human agency among the things and through the, uh, the creatures that God had made. Adam did not listen to God's warnings. And as we saw this morning, Adam suffered the expulsion from paradise that God said would happen if he disobeyed. But it was in that degraded state after a long time had passed that we are told there in, in verse 34, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. I lifted my eyes to heaven. That, that, that's as much a metaphorical statement as it is an actual statement. Yes, he may have physically looked heavenward, lifted his hands in, in, in uh, an expression of pleading with God. But the significant thing was that, that up until that point, he had been looking inward and downward, proving, as Luther tells us, that sin makes an individual incurvatus in se, turned in upon ourselves, obsessed with ourselves. And this king turns out from himself and looks up to the one enthroned above. It may well be that in his debilitated mental state, that's all he could do. All he could do was look up, grunt at God. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? A king who ruled an empire just making grunting noise to the Almighty. And yet God heard. God heard it. You know, just as an aside, you know, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't write off those whose mental capacities have been damaged seriously and they are not able to articulate themselves before God in the way that those with intact faculties are. We had um, a number of uh, people with disability came to our first church in Rich Hill when we were first there and there's one individual, one old lady, and all she could do was grunt. That's all she could do. But we knew exactly when she would grunt. Every time you mentioned the name Jesus from the pulpit, a grunt came from the back row. Isn't that wonderful? Didn't God rejoice in those grunts even more than he rejoiced sometimes in our attempts to sing? And that's what God was doing to Nebuchadnezzar. As he heard the grunt from the king coming from that field where he was with the animals. And he saved him. He was delivered. And he wasn't simply restored to the glory that was his in the past. But he was exalted to an even greater glory. Because now he was being lifted up as a man who had been remade in the image and likeness of God. Who had been made new in God's great salvation. And that deliverance entailed a restoration to glory. And that's the hope of the promise of the gospel, that those, we who have been defaced and degraded in our sin and are completely in, unworthy in ourselves are remade in the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friend, if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have God's solemn word, you are made new in his image and you are his child. As we listen to God's invitation 
and even just say yes to his invitation. I do. We experience God's saving grace and his mercy. I've spoken to you before about a dear soul who came to faith at the ripe old age of 82 um, and I'd worked with him on and off over a number of years without any sign of interest but the day he finally professed faith and, and met with me he was bubbling over with thankfulness that he had taken the step that he knew he should have taken as a teenager but didn't and he paused and said I've only got one regret I should have done it years ago. I shouldn't have left it so late. The same was true of Nebuchadnezzar. I wish I'd listened. I wish I'd responded whenever God had spoken to me in the first place and I would have been spared all this. And for us too, whether you're just at the beginning of life or whether you're nearing the end of life, it's never too late. Because any time that we pray the words to God, please save me, he will gladly say, of course I will. Yeah. And he will give you the peace and restoration that God gave to this king all those years ago. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this extraordinary story. Lord, it is, it's just amazing to think of what, what happened in that man's life the opportunities that you gave him earlier on in his reign that he did not take advantage of. And yet, when you brought him to his knees and exposed his utter helplessness in himself, and he cried out to you in desperation, you and your grace heard his cry and gave him mercy and made him new. Oh, we pray that you would repeat that story again and again in our day, in all kinds of places, from kings in their palaces, from politicians in their seats of power, right down to ordinary people in their homes and communities. We pray that people might call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Amen.